So with that, uh, if everyone's settled, I'm going to invite Carlton to start us off with a snapshot from Alternate Roots, a place of, and a, an organization that has a lot of history um, in this work. Good afternoon. Alternate Roots was founded in 1976 at the Highlander Center for Research and Education by performing artists living and working in southern communities. Highlander has an 80 plus year history of being a central pillar of southern multicultural organizing and a place where arts and culture quickly emerged as a central focus in both their institutional design and community organizing strategy. I always start there because it's important to understand the social justice foundation on which Roots stands. Roots is a member service organization that exists to provide support for the creation and presentation of original art in all its forms that is rooted in a particular place, tradition, or spirit. As a coalition of cultural workers, our work is intended to contribute to the elimination of all forms of oppression. The organization supports direct funding to artists for their professional development, their projects, and their partnerships. Through a ne nearly 40-year commitment to network building and convening, Roots helps to break the isolation of progressive artists working in the nation's most conservative region. As an institution, Roots supports the artistic growth of its member artists through learning exchanges, skills building, and leadership development and refinement. As with any foray into performance and placemaking, we must start with a look back in our journey, on our journey to this place. During the Civil Rights Movement, the Free Southern Theater, a cultural component of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and a founding organization of Roots, pioneered components of what is now called creative placemaking. Fifty years ago during Freedom Summer, FST performed 24 shows in 23 days in communities throughout rural Mississippi as part of a cultural and political strategy to enhance livability for black folks in the Jim Crow South. Through their deep engagement and organizing practice, they utilized theater arts as a tool to strengthen civic engagement by forging a pathway for Mississippians to exercise their right to both register and vote. Through this effort, SNCC was able to create avenues for job creation, upward mobility, and extend national understanding of cultural identity for African Americans in the Deep South. In the late 80s through the early 2000s, companies including Roadside Theater, Junebug Productions, Carpetbag Theater, Lears Lerman Dance Exchange, Bergonis Theater, Urban Bush Women, a traveling Jewish theater, just to name a few, used the vehicle of the American Festival Project to collaborate with artists, activists, educators, city, state, and federal liaisons, and art presenters in communities across the country to build support and capacity for long-term community transformation. Out of this extensive and deep collaboration, the Montana American Festival Project was born. This three-year statewide storytelling project encouraged cultural self-determination and dialogue among communities, farmers and ranchers, environmentalists, students, gay men and lesbians, among others, were involved in story circles and performances that focused on pride of place and pride of identity. This same group would go on to create the Environmental Justice Festival. This project was a six-year community development initiative led by Junebug Productions that teamed up resident and touring artists with New Orleans area activist groups to explore environmental racism and environmental justice issues. Community partners included the Gulf Coast Tennis Association, the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond, New Orleans Youth Action Corp, local churches and theater companies. Cry You One, a collaboration between New Orleans artist Mondo Bizarro and ArtSpot Productions, is an outdoor performance and online platform that brings together artists, tradition bearers, scientists, engineers, and city and state officials to deal with the issues of the disappearing wetlands of southeast Louisiana and the cultures that are disappearing with it. The work of Cry You One is a direct cultural descendant of the Environmental Justice Festival. Roots Fest 2011 was a five-year project led by Alternate Roots with the primary intent of building local capacity for cultural organizers and address national issues through the lens of a failed public works project called the Highway to Nowhere. This national highway project displaced more than 19,000 residents in West Baltimore. Roots Fest 2011 culminated in a five-day festival on 52 acres of green space in West Baltimore and included a three-day national learning exchange and a two-day free outdoor festival. Organizationally, it was the hardest work we had ever undertaken, and there were many, many, many mistakes made. But last weekend, Alternate Roots hosted a town hall gathering of community members in West Baltimore to revisit Roots Fest. We spent the day using theater and story circle methodology to explore the challenges, successes, and long-term impact of Roots' work in that community. 
We will use this as a launching pad to inform our actions as we march toward our 40th anniversary in 2016. Through our Partners in Action program, Alternate Roots supports artists working locally to activate relationships across sectors as a third partner. Our intent is to strengthen place-based work through leveraging our regional and national network of artists, cultural organizers, scholars, and activists to assess power structures and develop creative approaches to bring balance where inequity exists. Alternate Roots has a long and storied history in holding space for the people that make place matter. This work requires patience, consistency, and grounding. It is slow work that produces change at variable rates. It is rarely pretty, but the results are often beautiful and are essential to any process to support empowered, sustainable, community-owned solutions. Just any, uh, we actually have the moment for a question or an observation uh, in hearing Carlton talk about alternate routes. One. I would, I would want to observe Michael, just, just uh, recognize Michael Road. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, I would just note the number of people also around the room whose work has intersected with Roots over the years mm -hmm. and whose work has been informed by Roots. You know, I'm, I'm looking at NPN and thinking about the network of ensemble theaters and lots of folks here. And even Cry You One, the project that he was just talking about, is one that our Catalyst Initiative also supports. So just to notice the sort of web that makes the NNPN as well, to notice the web of relationships that make this ecology function in a, in a cross-sector world. Right. Uh, I think that uh, to just build on that, uh, when uh, Bill Rausch, who was at Cornerstone Theater in uh, California, moved to the Oregon Shakespeare Theater, a different, very different kind of a setting to bring ideas around how work is done in community, um, that was one of those moments for me that really represented uh, the exchange in parts of our practice and movement, or I don't want to call it field, I guess. Um, connecting and coming together in a, in a meaningful way, which I think we've seen uh, come forward in programming as well as um, as much as I had hoped. And so we end up with a Shakespeare theater that has a very different uh, look, feel, and, and footprint um, in its community and nationally. Um, and it gives me a chance to also really point out uh, the notion uh, that I think Sandra said quietly, but um, I want to really lift up, which is that really great and important work is growing from this motivation and this activity and action. Work that is recognized aesthetically, artistically, um, that it is not other. It is the work of new work uh, as well. So I want to really hold that up. Uh, final, anything else or, or call them? Thanks for bringing so many other names onto the table. So um, while we were uh, away, I was talking with Vijay and Victoria, uh, and we were just looking in at the Twitter feed. And um, one of the prompts that uh, our good friends at that little cafe table over there uh, gave uh, was, um, well, um, when is it not placemaking? Which I thought was a really, really good idea. Uh, and a really, really great prompt to throw out there. Um, and one that we should test ourselves with. One that we really have to say and be honest about when it's really not the motivation, the intention, the way that we're working, and the uh, objectives, goals, or outcomes that we're after. Uh, Sage Crump, who's been really active, thanks Sage, uh, on the Twitter today, um, went on to sort of say that um, it's not placemaking when it, um, has, uh, it has not relevance, um, and it's not placemaking um, when it's not done with intention. But she went on in a second Twitter feed to say, and that's okay too, that everything doesn't need to be connected, labeled, or gerrymandered to fit under this label. Um, and so I thought that was a really great contribution. Uh, our Twitter uh, followers have been paying attention to the discussions of economics, uh, the discussion of transformation uh, as well. So um, a lot of what you're saying here, um, and I know some of you are interacting um, as well, which is terrific uh, to move information around. Uh, so what, when is it not? Um, and I think for me, I think there is that tension in the room of um, how are you know how much are, have we uh, looked inside and looked at the ways that we can connect the way that we are working or our work is evolving 
uh, toward uh, concepts that connect or are in the creative placemaking definitions that are out there. Um, and I want to make sure that we don't feel um, that we all have to, you know, raise our hands and say, hey, uh, we love it and we're there. Um, so I want to make sure that there's room in the room to sort out uh, that work and, um, and that term uh, in terms of what we, when we're doing it and when we're not and when that's okay. MK. Yeah, this is MK with NPN Van. Um, but uh, when there is that much money involved and that much quote unquote new money introduced into the art sector, everyone is going to try to construct what they do as placemaking to have access to those resources. And so I, when you say when is, it's okay to be not intentionally engaged in placemaking, I completely agree with that. But you can't ignore the weight of this kind of resource and its impact on an under-resourced field. Right. Um, and it's a huge elephant that we can't okay. ignore. That's why we're putting it on the table. I've got uh, Colleen and then Colleen Jennings Brogan Sack, Arizona State University Gamage. One of the things we discussed in our small group setting is can inauthentic partnership become authentic? So to just counter what you're saying, not to oppose it, there are opportunities where you might want to bring other organizations, businesses, and groups to the table and encouraging them to engage in this, which would spread further what you need to have done. Um, Mark. This is a very, it's a very interesting question, and it's tricky uh, on a couple of levels. Uh, number one, I don't care if an institution doesn't want to be identified as a placemaker. I think inherent in being a placemaking, placemaking community connected organization, um, you will uh, receive some level of support. I have an issue when organizations decide um, or manifest not not connecting with their communities, and yet when there are times of trouble, you know, all of a sudden turn out and, and want and want those res resources um, and assistance. But it's it's interesting with that term placemaking because of, of, of placemaking because in this group we would probably identify certain organizations that are indeed doing this type of work. There may be major decision makers in a city or community with major funding resources that decide to them placemaking is having that anchor organization A B C you know to heck with any of the conversations we're having. You know, they decide this is our community. This is where our resources are going, often to the detriment of other organizations. So I just wanted to put that out there. So we can broaden. So I'm asking just for, as you reflected, maybe through your conversations at lunch or individually, um, what's uh, what really was sticky for you, um, and that could be sticky in that it. It help you. It's something you're holding on to, uh, and it could be sticky in that it left you unsettled, and you want to unpack it. Um, um, but also, perhaps some moments of, of clarity. Uh, Adam and I were having a conversation a little bit about the sort of root of creative placemaking, or maybe I'll make that one go this way. Um, and uh, what was already happening in the field, which was lots and lots of emphasis, um, helped by many of the service organizations in the room around. Uh, community engagement and audience engagement. Uh, and so to some degree, uh, some people use the terms community engagement and, it's, and they're really doing earnest work and it's about better con allowing and, and making ways for the community to connect to that cultural asset or that cultural resource. Or audiences to have a better experience in the work, audience engagement in that it's not passive anymore. Um, and so we are moving that language of engagement into a framework of placemaking here that may be um, means that we're having a conversation to a certain degree on two planes. So that was one moment where I had a little clarity in thinking well, we need to unpack that a little bit. Um, any, anyone else? Something that uh, happened in a room? Happened in a small conversation? Take your time. Well, this is Adam again, um, Adam Split with Ballet West. Um, I, I think just to um, build on what you've said a little bit more and from what I've been hearing all day, and again, I just repeat that it's someone who came uh, to this today without really any knowledge of what creative placemaking is, um, 
and perhaps I'm being a little too fixed in my approach with this question, but I still feel like there should be a clear-cut definition if we are going to use it in um, such a way that that is, is defining what we're going to accept as placemaking or not. Because uh, again, all of us are doing work in many different ways that speak to the, our communities in different ways and, and uh, are important. Um, or not, uh, or both. But um, if we are looking for uh, saying this is creative placemaking, then there really does have to be a clear-cut definition. Michael. Uh, Michael Rode. Um, I, I, it's, it's interesting that you kind of bring that up. I feel like that's a nice kind of thing to bounce against, in a way. And you put up there, sticky. And I, I feel like um, one of the harder notions to sort of interrogate is intentionality. Because you can speak to your own intentionality, but you can surmise the intentionality of others unless you actually engage them in dialogue. And then you choose whether to be generous and accept the intentionality presented to you as honest and authentic, or if you doubt intentionality. So if many of us are saying that placemaking has to do with intentionality at its core, with values, and practice is always connected to that, then how do we introduce something that is so... Uh, personal and internal to uh, notions of measurement and criteria and uh, public dialogue. It's a good call. You're quiet. Pretty animated before. What happened? Is it really just? Oh, come on! I don't dance. Uh, I don't I, sing. I, I I'll respond. <laughs> um, I think um, we were having this conversation earlier in the language uh, mm -hmm. discussion, and you know the push for a clear definition. Uh, I think sometimes uh, we have to look at the unintentional effects of language, and how in the attempt to create something that is providing access, we're actually creating something that is creating that is being a barrier um, to access. Uh, and so, you know, as MK pointed out, there's a lot of resources. And we can't have this conversation around this table without talking about the resources that are going in to support this work um, under this particular rubric of definition, of understanding, of, of, of intention. Uh, and, and so when asking the question, who's the language for, you know, the language is created not for those that are doing the work, but for those who, try, who are trying to understand, understand the work. It. Um, and so where's the space for those that are doing the work to have access, understanding that there is a historical thread of under-resourcing of those communities in many ways that have not created the, the, the space for them to build the capacity to be competitive in, in applying through the language. And so those that have done the work mostly out of necessity um, get left out of the, the process. And so that's I think, is important for us to, to keep on the table as an understanding of the historical thread that is being pulled. We didn't just land in this space. Uh, this, this comes from many years of work that has been researched, has been studied, has been looked at. And these initiatives are in response to those, to those practices. Susan. Um I don't want to put you on the spot, but <laughs> I might anyway. Um, I think I was thinking about Mellon and the fact that Mellon has uh, participated in Art Place, but has also been investing in this realm of work, arena of work, uh, independently and um, in different ways. And I just wondered if you had a, a couple of thoughts about how you're thinking about uh, the performance work that you support as a regular uh, basis and, and how all these things fit together from, from your perspective. I think the one can't exist without the other. And I think that we've just sought to um, find a balance between um, initiatives focused on place and those focused upon around people and the art making. And <clears throat> uh, given our historical um, orientation toward the art making, it's just been, I think, my role in this to be the gadfly and to make sure that the one doesn't get lost. Yeah, no. um, that's important. I really appreciate that. Thank you. So 
um, so the, the the sense of where the resource, you know, what does the resource do uh, in terms of uh, what it uh, says this is it, you know, that funding says this is the practice in some respects. Um, and yet, uh, Art Place was really set up as an experiment. It was very intentionally said, we're going to do a lot of stuff. We're going to support a lot of different kinds of things. Um, so I think the uh, desire for a definition, um, I came into this meeting with also. I was like, well, we better put it out there. You know, like, let's make sure it's on one of the walls. And then we kind of realized that we really were doing the opposite. We were devising theater, that we were trying to pull out all the different ways people think, talk, relate, and give term and give language. Um, so I think we're doing exactly what we need to do. And whether definitions for particular programs or agencies or funders will uh, morph, or the uh, I love the way the group put it this morning, you know, the intentions, the examples, uh, and the defined outcomes uh, will be uh, presented, will begin to shift, uh, is probably um, uh, would be a really great outcome for this. Um, but I keep moving back and forth between saying, if it is something, then what is it? Um, and do I, you know, am I in the box or am I outside of that box? Uh, or, or am I not going to? Is deep description um, and taking the time to do deep description of work so that we are showing it from the inside out as opposed to from the label and the so on down. Um, and for us, uh, we have seen that to make a really big difference um, in really getting to understand work from the inside of looking at how it works. Um, and uh, the uh, Network of Ensemble Theaters has really taken big steps in that way through uh, their microfests to do that, Ashley. So I'll just a little bit of context. The microfests were a series of convenings. There were four around the U.S. looking at this question of placemaking. Uh, it was in Detroit, excuse me, Appalachia. We were in Knoxville and Harlan County, Kentucky. We were in New Orleans and then Honolulu. So over the course of uh, a year, we looked at this, um, this question from an artist's perspective and how are the artists defining the places uh, defining the work where they live and allowing people, inviting many, uh, raise your hand if you went to one of those, just so we can get it's a little a context for people who are in the room. Okay. Um, and so the, they were experiential events. And I think that that's part of the challenge, like within this kind of setting, is that um, we're, we're talking about the ideas of it and what, as artists, as practitioners, like in some ways, we need to be on the ground and you need to see it and feel it to then start to articulate what it is and what it looks like. And so to drive you through a neighborhood in southwest Detroit and say, here are the murals, and here's what this community is doing, and who, and meet Eric Howard, is a very different way to start to think about language than sitting around in a table, which is, I, this is great. Um, <laughs> great. Uh, but it's just, a, it's a different way of experience and development, and that we, at the end of that animating democracy, published a, a long document that was really from the perspective of what is the learning that artists are doing and how are we articulating what the work looks like. And there's, uh, there's something for me about being at ease or being okay with the multiplicity of meaning and that we can take this word, but it's, I mean, it's like love. Like it has so many definitions depending on who you ask. And so how do we look at placemaking and realize like to open it up to what it means in Detroit may look really different than what it means in New Orleans or may look really different than in mm -hmm. Utah. And so how can we be okay with multiple identities? And as an artist, I'm, I'm actually, uh, I, I need that. Teresa, thank you. It's Teresa from TCG. And I, want, I wanted to add that it can have multiple meanings depending upon the life form of the organization. Mm -hmm. um, because I think about um, organizations that are perhaps slightly larger institutions that are based in communities that are doing um, really remarkable work in placemaking, but it's not, they're not, you know, they're, it's, it's based around, to some extent, it might be based around their building. Or I think about La Jolla Playhouse doing their um, Without Walls Festival when they finally realized that, you know, given their climate, they could be doing work out, outside. 
and commissioning work and doing all that, <laughs> you know, instead of just in their building. Or uh -huh. why is it? And or I think about um, Berkeley Rep and their their new uh, production center that they're finding different ways to make the resource of that space available to the community and connecting with the specific community that they're in. Um, so I'm just thinking about all the different ways that placemaking can have meaning based on what Ashley just said. Jason. This is great, and I'm totally going to say placemaking is just like love now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I don't think that we at the NEA want to own the term, right? And I do like the fact that people are, the reason we're having today is for people to like put forward the multiple meetings and, and to put all the issues on the table and to really just put a stake in the ground about where the conversation is right now in the country. So your honesty is incredibly useful to us. So I mean, I, um, I would say, cool, yeah. You know, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not really for like, this is it, you know. Um, I'm really for what does it mean to you and, um, and help us understand what it means to you. And it might be that it means a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Colleen, when, when I go back to the board and it says sticky and unsettled, well, there are just two things that have stuck with me. And, and one is we actually do a series of programs where we serve military families who are transient. Mm -hmm. I'm a military brat. We moved every three years. And so our notion of connecting those communities is that we connect with them and then they take it to other places. So that placemaking isn't this one spot or this one focus, but it actually moves with you. So that was one thing. And then the other thing is the notion that an artist can create place for us, leave it with us, and go away. And I think about um, Pat Graney and Pat coming and doing Keeping the Faith with us 15 years ago. And Pat came, she did the work, she left, and we went, wait a second we want to stay doing the work that Pat gave us, which was working in the prisons. And so we entitled our program Journey Home. We brought Pat back. She ingrained, no pun intended, uh, all of her spirit and her liveliness in our home artists. And to this day, we still do that program. Do that program. Yeah. That's great. Uh, that reminds me of a um, the story of the shipyard project, Liz, Liz Lyman's project in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which was very much about place. Um, it was about the, the fear that the shipyard which was uh, income and industry to that community would be gone. And some people in the community that felt pretty good about that because building nuclear submarines didn't feel like something they wanted in their community. Um, but most others had uh, a history uh, very much tied to that project. So it's a two-year project. Uh, it's a two-year project that brings the art of storytelling and making story um, and making story into dance. Um, and a Wallace Foundation got involved about, oh, I think it was about 10 years after, and helped them to create, this goes to Mark's question earlier, a book that looked at what happened that the community attributed to its roots in the shipyard project. Um, that they have in Portsmouth, they are known as one of the communities that has the most community-engaged dialogue about all public policy issues. Um, this was not the only thing that created that. They were part of study circles. They were part of other community dialogue efforts. But community capacity and the ways that they organized, as Mitch was saying, informal arts participation, the way artists that were in the community began to use some of the same kinds of techniques to um, add to the way that they were doing it, you can look at, at a history of activity, literal activity in a community that emanated or at least attributed can back to that two-year experience with that performing arts uh, residency. A residency model, really, um, is what's at the core of that um, that was there. And so um, I think that that really gets uh, that notion of what is left behind, especially by artists who, by the way, sometimes bring a great deal to a community by coming in new and neutral. Um, and so we don't want to misinterpret, I think, also all new <laughs> thinking about place as um, always um, the, that the only uh, authenticity comes from the artist within because mixing it up um, is where some of the uh, pro provocative stuff begins to happen um, or the platform gets laid in a new way. Um, so I'm going to look around one more time for things that are on your mind. Good. I, I, I'm quoting Carlton again, as we're all doing. Um, in our, I may be misquoting him, but in our working group, 
Um, he said something I wrote down. For community arts organizations, the work is a necessity, not a choice. Mm -hmm. And I, I just found that really um, provocative in terms of um, new artists and new organizations coming into the arena and whether um, they can be as grounded in the necessity, um, even though they may have entered it um, through the door of choice. So I, I, I'm just thinking about what you said and be curious to hear if you have any, any response, Carlton. I think there's always, uh, we're talking about transformation, um, that word that people really don't want to deal with, uh, but it requires you to, to be something different than what you are today. Uh, and I think ultimately the work that we're doing, I, I can only speak from an organizational uh, perspective and alternate roots and as an artist who's been doing this work and being mentored by people like, like uh, Linda Paris Bailey and John O'Neill and Dudley Cock and, and, and you know, MK and these folks that have taught me um, and helped me to understand my role as, as an artist but also my role as a citizen and as someone who is trying to bring about equitable circumstances to communities that have been left behind and abandoned. Um, you know, I think there's opportunity for us. We all have to pitch in to do the work of transforming our society into what we see it needs to be. And if we feel satisfied to just do the work as we've been doing it without um, an understanding that the world around us has, has rapidly changed and our response to it has to, has to shift our understanding of our work um, and our presence in community. Um, so I think there's always opportunity for people to grow and expand their understanding of how they engage their community in bringing about a fair, more fair and equitable system um, and systems that help to run those communities. Um, I think what happens is, like I said before, the, the language and, and we can't take off the table the fact that what we're talking about is not just creative placemaking. We're talking about funding and resources that are being made available to support this work in community. And so the question goes back to, you know, not just uh, where the funding goes, but who has the capacity to apply for the funding. Everyone sitting around this table can, because we have development groups and we have, you know, uh, we have, you know, fundraising teams and all of that stuff. But a lot of the community organizations that do this work every day, many of them not even being paid a living wage, um, may not have the same uh, ability to do that. So it, it's, it's about thinking, when we're talking about creative placemaking, I think if we're not infusing equity into our conversations, then we're just reduplicating the same failed systems that, that I think foundations and you know, government and, and many of our institutions have been a part of in the past. And what I'm talking about is changing the way that we think about our place and our relationship and our network as a group of organizations and as individuals to shift the way that things are being done. Michael. I want to tag on to that the notion of capacity building, knowledge building, and field building, and the complexity of that amidst circumstances and conditions of privilege and power and language. We know that both our place and our town are moving into sort of knowledge building and field building in ways that I find very exciting and useful, but I also know the conversations are really complicated in terms of how that work happens, who gets resources, where expertise is located. And also, you know, Carlton just spoke about mentors who've helped bring him into this work and how we both are a part of an ecology that supports and sustains the mentors who exist in lots of places and how we also find ways that acknowledge privilege, that invite mentors to also be available and active in places that aren't their places but where they have things to offer as work gets scaled, as ideas move around, as resources get spread. I think that's really just interesting and, and uh, Absolutely. complicated. Coming over to Noah, we're glad to. Um, I just wanted to tag on to um, Adam's question on what Carlton said. And I, what I'm hearing are um, there's a dichotomy of trying to establish a fixed definition of what creative placemaking is. But Carlton's use of um, a lot of active language suggests that the concept is evolutionary and that it's moving forward. And Ashley was talking about this in our small group, that we're on a continuum. And so maybe the problem with establishing a definition is that you can't put a pin in a map and make it fixed when the process of creative placemaking and what we're all trying to do is moving forward and also looking backward and transform transformational, which is 
you know, the problem word, but we are continuing to seek new answers. So maybe that's why we cannot come up with a fixed definition for something that's moving through time as we're discovering this. Sarah, I'm sorry. Oh, six of great. I guess that, along that, um, part of what uh, I'm think I've been thinking about is about th this is long term engagement, and um, all of these grants are short term in relationship to what are the resources that the organizations and the communities are actually having to deal with post this project or post this idea, and are we uh, creating the infrastructure and the knowledge that actually can. Um, lift up other people to take on this project? And where are, what does that actually mean for arts organizations who are already over-resourced, as well as artists who are, who are completely under-resourced? Under right? like, uh, I'm sorry, over, like, in, um, uh, over, over ambitious, I would get. But in, in terms of, if we're looking at resources development and like resource allocation, it's not just about this, these, this time period, but what is the long-term aspect? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Um, I was just going to ask Sarah or Sandy if, as you're listening to that as organizations uh, more in, uh, regularly engaged in contemporary and new work, um, if there's any other spin that you put on a little of this conversation that's um, from your perspective. Yeah, this is Sarah from On the Boards. And, you know, I have kind of not been saying anything during this part. Um, my little snapshot part comes up next. And a big question for me, really, is we don't use the term placemaking. And, you know, what I'm going to do is just show you guys a bunch of the programs that we do. And, and hopefully it leaves with a bunch of questions over, I don't know if any of it's placemaking or not. Um, for us, we really, um, we... I guess I should just start talking a little bit about this. But um, we really look at um, trying to create the community that we want to show our art in, rather than looking at thinking. We used to believe that art um, that we produce would create a community. And that was a big shift for us a couple years ago. And um, we don't see that change in community uh, really related to place. We see it as the relationships that we have within Seattle, within the Northwest, within the contemporary performance field, because it's such a small part of the arts field. Um, and we really, uh, so our definition is really, we, we think of ourselves as trying to build the capacity of our community rather than transforming it in any way. And um, but, but the actual term place is something that really doesn't come into our conversations very often. So this is Sandy Arnold at um, your Pueblo Center for the Arts, and for us, we're actually a little bit of the opposite right now. So place comes into our conversations all the time. Um, we're very place focused at the moment. You know, we've been doing a lot of learnings lately where we find out that there are people in our community who just don't know who we are. You know, um, so we're um, doing a concerted effort to find particular neighborhoods and particular communities within those neighborhoods to reach out to who we haven't had relationships with before. And those are very place-based, going into the mission, going into SOMA, which is our backyard, but some people still don't know where we're located, even though we're right there. Um, so place is something that's really important for us right now, and um, placemaking does. I mean, that term, we, we do use it. Um, I don't know that we all agree on exactly what it means, and I, we use it very flexibly. Um, but yeah, place, something we're something focused there. on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to be transitioning soon to uh, Sarah's story from Seattle and to our afternoon conversations. Um, I want to make sure that uh, I'm so glad to see you talking to each other. Um, now the conversation has shifted from what we brought into the room to how you're playing with the ideas that are on the table. I appreciate that, Mitch. This is Mitch with Chorus America. And I have a hard time and have for years separating um, placemaking as a practice of community development and then a funding model. And so I'm just wondering if, if and when the placemaking funding goes away, because organizations like Art Place will sunset, will the term stay around? Is that something that is on the mind of the, these two larger funders, or is it the area of practice that you are hoping will be the legacy of the work that you are doing? And that can be rhetorical, or Jamie could answer. <laughs> no, <I'm, laughs> 
okay, or it can be both. <laughs> All right, there we go. Um, so what's nice it's question. it's an interesting moment for me because um, a week and a half ago. Uh, I was just in Chicago with all of our foundation presidents, and we were sort of affirming what Art Place is. And um, those foundations went through a strategic planning process before I was recruited to be executive director, and this was a chance for our staff to sort of articulate back to the foundations what we heard. And sort of to Mitch's point, we're now, the way we talk about ourselves is that Art Place is a 10-year project, so we will sunset in 2020. We've got four years down, six to go. So Art Place is a 10-year project that's dedicated to positioning art and culture as a core sector of community planning and development. So our goal, what we hope to achieve by 2020, is that any time a mayor, a CDC, an MPO, seats a conversation about a future of a community, art and culture is at the table right alongside housing, transportation, public safety, open space. And that each of those is seen as a sector that needs planning and investment from its community. And each of those is seen as a sector that has a responsibility to contribute to its community's future. So one of the reasons we give large grants, our average grant last year was I think $330,000, is because we're looking to fund projects. We're not looking to, to fund institutions. We're not looking to fund ongoing. But we want to get folks, we want to be able to give entities enough money to get something done. So our goal is to fund as close to 100% of an ask as possible, to give it up front in one payment, and say, get this done, but understand we're paying for one project, and we're hoping to have this as one of the points of light that will sort of help us move the needle. I'm mixing metaphors, sorry. Um, in terms of that repositioning <laughs> of our culture as a core sector. Actually. Yes, I know, right. It's very, I'm bipartisan now that I'm out of government. <laughs> Um, sort of stuff. So, you know, our, our interest is not in building up any brand equity or institutional equity in and of ourselves. Our, our goal is to really recognize the extraordinary work that's happening, help support it, help connect it with each other, and stay out of the way as much as possible. So, I mean, that's, so it's a fascinating question and a fascinating moment for me. Great. Thank you. I'm going to go to Jason, if I can, before Howard. Thanks. Sure. I mean, we're interested in the practice, not the terminology. And we're interested in the practice um, spreading and being supported in the ways that it needs to be supported across the country. Um, to me, the way I, I've always viewed the term, not to keep dwelling on language, we need to move on from language. Uh -huh. Hopefully this afternoon we're going to talk about okay. how to do work. Um, uh, I know we will. Uh, the is uh, it, It's a policy frame, right, to project support for the work that's been happening on the ground since the time of Michelangelo. And, um, uh, I, that's what I hope, is that at the end of, I, have no, I can't talk about, I have no idea where the NTA is going at the moment, but I'm uh, just kidding. Um, I do. <laughs> uh, the, that we okay. in, end in a place where it is not, this is what I always say. I enter a lot of conversations about community building with a lot of different, all different kinds of parties, and it's always more often than not, oh, we're working on our environment, jobs, housing, transit strategy, and that's our little arts project over there, you know? And I want it to be, oh, we're working on a community development project, it's our art transit, it's what Jamie said, arts transit housing, that they, ha they have a seat at the table, that, the, that people understand what it means to engage artists and arts organizations seriously in these conversations, understands, understand what it means to pay arts, artists and arts organizations to be involved in these conversations, and what both sides of the field needs. A lot of the non-arts people need education about how to work with arts and arts organizations, and a lot of the arts artists and arts organizations need a lot of help on how to engage in those conversations. I think we're you know, 50 years into 100 years of development of this field, particularly in the United States. And it, it's going to be a long time till, till everybody kind of gets it. But we're, it's not rocket science, and we can figure it out. So yeah. that's right, kind of right. where I'm in my head. I don't, you know, the language is whatever. I want to weave together two thoughts. Mark, you asked before about measurement, and I've been thinking about that throughout the rest of the conversation, and we've just heard from Jamie talking about core sector of uh, community planning, how we, we become part of community planning. At New World Symphony, we have become part of the future of Miami Beach and the city of Miami. They wouldn't make a move, in certain moves, certain moves, without being in touch with us. And if you think about a measure of, of progress, that's, a, that's real. So um, I, think, I think what Jamie is intending is actually happening, and that's something that we could use as a measure. It's really important. It also, I'm sorry, good. Michael, go ahead. Well, I, I just want to um, 
maybe jump off that and, and say th um, the, the way you said that, that they wouldn't make a move without you, without further explication, is an interesting question, which is, does that mean they wouldn't make a move without your approval? Or does that mean they wouldn't make <laughs> a move without including you as a process partner in creating an equitable right. and healthy community? You been to Miami lately? <laughs> it wouldn't be approval, but it would be opinion. They would want to know what's on our mind. So then the values that you all bring to that conversation in relation to the rest of your community become both the asset and mm -hmm. the point of view that you offer in what Jamie was describing. So that then becomes the conversation, partly, that we're having, right? So I just, I just want to kind of pull those things apart, at least for me. I, I think that's a really important thing to pull apart, because if we have... Uh, community-based organizations or institutions that are succeeding in getting to the table, in being a part of things, then to what degree they are bringing, helping to bring forward values, to what degree they're helping to bring forward their peers uh, in, the, in the arts and cultural community um, or their partners in their community work to that table as well. Um, so, that, so with that, opportunity become, comes responsibility that I think is uh, taken pretty seriously in this room in terms of uh, what values we're bringing to the table when we go. So I've got uh, Susan, and then we'll come to Colleen. I just want to bring forward something that's been on my mind sort of in and out all day, um, and that is the um, title of this being Beyond the Building. Howard's, um, both projects were rooted in the creation of building mm -hmm. and in transforming place. And if you think about the history of orchestras and opera companies in this country, and Jesse does say that this is late in coming to, uh, orchestras are late in coming, but the specific impact of community began with the rise of these institutions and the building of buildings that were focal points of the community. So in the um, spirit of not being exclusionary, I'd like to think about reclaiming the building as part of what we were thinking about rather than moving beyond the building. In both. All right, and Colleen. And I think uh, along those lines, the whole notion of measurement to me, it depends upon who's measuring. So with the program that we've been in the prisons for 15 years, the measurement for the prisons are our program provides the lowest recidivism rate for those inmates. The other measurement is the young women and older women who get out of those program out of the prisons. We provide we're working with a place who provides housing for them. And then one of our donors has taken on providing an educational fund for each of them who get through it. So, so what's the success measurement? The institution, the journey, the individual. The other thing is, uh, and Sixto brought this up, and I just want to reiterate, I think about the National Theater Project, of which several of us are advisors in. And that notion is not just to provide funds for devised theater, but to provide technical support for those smaller institutions who don't have the capacity to do what they need to do. And so I think that's, I, I just want to underscore that. And then I keep drawing pictures of umbrellas and writing CPM on them. <laughs> and for some reason, in my mind, this is an umbrella, and there are things underneath the umbrella. So. Great. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to transition um, and save just a few minutes for further conversation when we get into the how. Uh, conversation about opportunities and challenges in the work. And so I'm going to invite Sarah to snapshot uh, on, on the boards now. Um, and then uh, immediately after, we're going to organize our presenters uh, for the next set of summary responses. So if you're one of them, um, be thinking that you could be up in a matter of seconds. <laughs> Okay, so you guys basically know, I, I just told you what I'm going to do when I'm up here, so um, I'm just going to give you a real broad swath of what we're doing, and it, I'm going to use our language in the way that we talk about it, and hopefully it just brings up a lot of questions by the end um, for you guys as we're sitting and having this whole conversation. Um, on the boards. For those of you who might not know us, we're a 37-year-old contemporary performing arts center out in Seattle, Washington. And our mission is really to produce and present innovators from our own community as those from around the world. I should have figured this out first. Oh, yeah. Okay. So should I just, like... 
I knew when I knew that? Okay. Um, so I really just answered the question, how does our work intersect with our community? And you can see our definition of community is really about the people who make up our geographic area, and for us, that's Seattle and the Northwest. And then we really define it as um, the greater contemporary performance art field itself. So that's a really different definition of community than we've talked about today. And for us, um, this just goes back to that idea that I talked about where we decided that we were going to make an active move to try to create a community ourselves rather than just letting our art create that community. So we wanted to be proactive in what is our social responsibility. And so we really changed programs to focus on three areas, bringing new voices to the table, building relationships across the community, and further developing the artists and audiences who we work with. Those are old and new. Um, so here's just a little snapshot. So the Ambassador Project is something that we've done for a few years. We bring in 16 cultural and civic leaders and ask them to join our organization each year. They bring new voices and perspectives, not only to the programs that we present, but to who we are interior as our organization. And we really want to think of them as a cross-section of the creative community. Um, somebody said a fingerprint of a community earlier. And this is with regards to you know, race, gender, age, but also creative discipline. And what we want to be able to do is start relationships between those community members and help us identify as a city who makes up our creative community. What is our creative industry and what does it look like? How do we strengthen that? And these guys are paid to shape the dialogue about the art presented on the boards in the creative community, meaning we trust them and we're investing in them actually having an output. Um, here's just uh, a project that they put together last year where some of the ambassadors brought some traveling South African musicians to work alongside um, Seattle musicians. Another thing here that we do is our studio suppers. And this is really for us about building relationships between the people who already come to our theater. And also um, making closer ties within the creative industries of dinner that are prepared by local chefs. And it's really about reimagining that idea of what it means to come to a theater and who you're going with, creating relationships amongst the people. We actually see every single person at those dinners um, so that we know how those relationships are being built. And admissions on a sliding scale starting at $25, so everyone's equal in that room. There's artists next to patrons next to board members. And we pay all the chef's costs, but we also split the proceeds and give them to a charity of the chef's choice. We've already given $16,000 out to charities within our community over the last two years. There's just a picture. You see everyone's talking, building relationships. And this is um, <laughs> the tables are hung from our grid. It's great. OK, that's it. Um, so on the board's TV, this is our platform. That's an online website where we distribute, right now, 40 full-length performance films out to audiences around the world. We have 135 countries right now. And I put this in here because I think it really challenges that definition of what's community and what's place. Um, and so a few of the things that we're doing within that project we have what we call the Community Screenings Project, where we take films that have social relevance into communities, rural communities in Washington and Oregon that have identified themselves to us. And we bring out programming to those communities through these films. And um, it's, it's a great program. Uh, curriculum development. Right now, this is artist-led curriculum development. And this is about kind of um, thinking about the future of our community here. Who are these people? And we do that with our 80 university partners that use this stuff as new curriculum development. And our presenting online partnership is we don't film our own films. We also film with all of our peers. So it's not just our voice or our artists that are being represented. Um, here is a really terrible picture from um, a, a screening up in Tyaton, Washington, uh, where you can see all the community program going around that. Um, and finally, I just wanted to talk about some of the programming changes that we've made. And we really want to think about what is programming that engages, um, and not just interest, but really holds um, a different level of participation. And uh, this spring, we're having Detroit's complex movements coming. A major part of their residency in Seattle, where they're here for five weeks, is community-led, community-instigated social justice projects that the artists have been working with for over about six months. Um, Emily Johnson's coming in the fall. Hers is all about what is volunteerism, what are shared meals. Um, what is your native culture? How are you participating in the fishing industry in Seattle? So these are really different questions. Um, we're also doing off-site programs to try to change what it means to be invited to participate. Um, we're trying new presentation and development formats that are really responsive to the way that artists are working, because that's where you find the real relevance in a community is following that. 
And then we're trying to bring in all kinds of new constituents that you can see at the bottom, including really opening our space up to be a community center. Um, that's complex movements. And then this is just a last thought about what we say and how we talk about our community building. Um, I'm going to try to read it here. Our work is about our long-term place in our community and its role and impact over time. We strive to contribute relevant perspectives to civic and global dialogue and to broaden the number of people in these conversations. We want to help create a community that is able to tackle and have dialogue around complex issues. And so that's kind of a snapshot of our work. I was really moved when I read Sarah's uh, comments uh, first uh, as the responses came in to really uh, turning the notion around about talking about uh, bringing uh, the idea and spirit of innovation and ideas uh, through the work as really understanding that as a sort of leading edge place. Um, and it reminds me also that when we talk about sort of the origins of terms and the origins of work, uh, to a certain degree, we have to acknowledge that we also, uh, place, creative placemaking came forward after Richard Florida. And Richard Florida was talking about creatives and communities, but he was talking about a set of creatives that really weren't about the arts and cultural assets, uh, local or otherwise, of communities. Um, and so we were also positing this um, in that conversation uh, as well. And I think it's worth keeping that uh, little you know, marker in, in line as well, because uh, it was really that, Jamie. Uh, just one thing to add to that is, at least my experience of that origin is actually much more of Teresa's experience, uh -huh. which is its rooting in Jane Jacobs, because it also came after Jane Jacobs. And if you, the, at least the way I engage with it, is the placemaking, which is sort of local, holistic, human-centered community development and adding the creative interventions. And not that one is right or the other, just to complicate and just say that it has many antecedents. Well, and I would, I would wait personally more the Jane Jacobs and the Richard Florida. As would I. And, and the reason I'm putting my hand over my heart is to say that I agree with you wholeheartedly. But I know that Richard Florida was on the podium at like every conference about creative cities across the country at every level, talking about creatives as something different than what we're talking about here. Um, so I, that's why I say that. I just say it in terms of the platform that he had and the way that uh, the term was beginning to be engaged by people in communities other than the arts. So just that from that, because I totally uh, agree with you there. Um, I'm going to move us into our next set of uh, summaries and uh, questions. Uh, and the afternoon was really framed in terms of our questions about opportunity and uh, and challenge. Uh, it's about the how of the work. And um, we volunteered uh, several other folks to take a look at your summaries uh, and to help us move that conversation forward. So uh, I'm putting my papers in order and reminding myself of everything happening. Here we go. Uh, so we're going to be hearing from Claudia, uh, Noah, uh, and Sixto. Uh, we're going to be taking up issues and impact. Uh, relationships and resources and equity. And uh, so just like this morning, we've got time for a uh, presentation. We'll take a few minutes to unpack a little, and then we'll move quickly on so that we can get into the small groups. Um, it's my read that we should get ourselves to those small groups um, and make sure that they have time. So I'm going to uh, just uh, calibrate just a little bit differently than this morning. So um, if that's good, and Claudia, if you're ready, and where do you want to speak from? I'm ready, and I think I'll just stick where I am. This feels so convenient. I have my own <laughs> microphone. It's brilliant. Um, I, so, so very quickly, um, what are the types of community issues or needs that are best addressed by placemaking activities? Um, I believe all of our respondents um, responded by listing everything that they did. <laughs> um, what is the intent of the activity and the impact? So. Um, Oh, Ashley Sparks says that performance work can make issues seen. Um, and um, uh, the responses that were listed uh, talked a lot about just reflection, education um, on issues of equity, um, social justice, reconciliation, um, historic preservation, um, talking about uh, different areas like abandoned neighborhoods, converted military bases. Um, so so um, it, it's a very broad 
um, the things that people talked about in terms of what can you address well with placemaking activities. Um, I, something that was said was that you needed a true and equal partnership between organizations. Um, and that this uh, relationship, it needs to be holistic. It's recognizing that issues are interconnected rather than individual problems um, and uh, understanding the nuance of the issues of the community rather than assuming what they are or what they might be from the outside was also a very important thing that people listed. Um, Teresa talked about um, bringing people together from a variety of economic and social backgrounds to know each other, feel comfortable with each other, and be able to communicate effectively across distance. Um, and um, several other people just talked about how um, live performing arts, that's one of their mechanisms. One of those mechanisms is just simply bringing people together, and that is a, that's a deep thing in and of itself. Um, that convening function alone strengthens the civic fabric in communities. That came from Mark. Um, and um, uh, Sandra Bernhardt uh, said something very helpful when she was, she was talking about um, creating a community demands trust. The intent of our activity is to create together. Relationship is first, period. So it's not only talking about community um, as specific places, but also community as the thing that we are doing together as a verb, um, not just as noun. Um, and then the last question on this was, what is the intent of the activity and what is the impact? Um, and let me just open it up to the table to unpack those issues. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, so issues and impact. Uh, some sense that really it's about how we're taking them up, not which issues. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and that it's the relationship building around that that makes that effective. Uh, other things that you want to take a few seconds to add to that or to uh, bring forward and, and take another few minutes with impact if you would like? <laughs> this is Sandy at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, and it seems to me that this category would be a really good place to talk about evaluation and right. finding innovative ways, new ways to um, figure out what those measurements can be, and not just the quantitative things that we can easily count, but um, finding ways to really um, follow the qualitative and learn from that and how to ask the right questions around this topic so that we can really know that we're moving this forward. I like the idea of following the qualitative a good deal. Um, I think one of the challenges that we have seen around the questions of impact in this work, uh, and Mark Stern really uh, informs my thinking a lot. Uh, his voice is kind of often in my head, uh, I guess. And the first thing he always goes to is, uh, you know, what's, what's the scale? What's the unit that you're measuring? Uh, is it the project uh, that ArtPlace is, is, is looking at? Is it the institutional impact over time uh, and that capacity kind of building? Is, you know, where, where do we look or do we look at one project or as they did in Tucson, Arizona, uh, many artists doing many projects at a very small scale? Um, but what does that add up to in terms of uh, feelings of belonging, of engaging different people, what's the whole um, takeaway when a set of projects enable cultural participation or cultural production um, altogether. So um, one of the places we have to look is to, to think about scale and sometimes aggregation, I think. Uh, other thoughts or questions about that? This is Sarah from On The Boards. And this is really um, just a question. But with Art Place being um, around for a finite period of time, and with us focusing on the um, idea that the impact of a lot of these projects is so long term, um, is there any way that Arts Place is thinking about following up to be able to check in on these projects after you guys have sunsetted, especially for the second half project? So not after we've sunset, no. Um, and I think what's, what's interesting, and I've spent a lot of time with both Dr. Stern and Seifert's, uh, I think Dr. Stern made some remarks recently in Baltimore mm -hmm. where he talked about place placemaking outcomes. Uh, and then there's a sort of now infamous uh, Marcus and Gadwa uh, fuzzy outcomes thing. Is I think there, there are at least two kinds of research questions to be asked. And one of them is sort of what happens when art happens, right? Art happens and a number of things happen and we want to understand all of them. And I think that's an interesting research question. That's not one that we are picking up. 
the one that we're picking up is the one that's much more project-based, which is within that framework of art and culture operating within the framework of community planning and development. There is a specific community planning and development outcome that the art project is trying to help achieve. And that may happen within an 18-month project period. It may happen within the six years of life we have remaining. It may happen beyond that. And we've seen our um, research director is another NEA Lama woman called Jamie Hand. And she spent a lot of time um, thinking through the different options that folks have. And one of the things that we're really interested in doing is making sure that the field has a suite of options that are right-sized for whatever they're doing. So we have a project in Philadelphia whose evaluation system involves a guy with a pencil and a clipboard and 15 minutes a day who literally counts a number of people in each part of a public space, the porch at 30th Street Station. So the cost of a pencil, a piece of paper, and 15 minutes of this gentleman's time. We have a project in Eastport, Maine, where they're trying to do an economic revitalization of the downtown, and they're counting the number of members of their local chamber of commerce, which is now at 150, and the two most recent additions in a town of 1,300 that is the second largest town in the county are a pet store and a candy store. And to them, that means their residents are moving beyond just struggling to survive and moving into thriving mode, right? There's time for catnip and gumball. And we think that is the right size thing for what they're doing. And at the far end of the spectrum is the Santo Domingo Pueblo in New Mexico that has a formal partnership with Johns Hopkins University to look at community wellness outcomes related to an art and culture trail. So whether it's a piece of paper and a pencil, whether it's a number of members of a chamber of commerce, or whether it's a full out research partnership with Johns Hopkins University, you know, depending on what you're trying to do, any of those might be the right size. And I think all of them are valid for the projects that are working on. So um, that's a long way of saying, no, we won't be following up after we sunset. <laughs> I'm going to move us to the next conversation uh, and hope that the uh, folks in this conversation will take up some of this or that we can come back to it in our summary. I have lots to say about it also, but um, I'm watching time. Uh, so I think we will uh, go on and um, invite... Ooh, I'm forgetting my papers. Forgetting everything. All right. Uh, where are you going to speak from? You're going to stay where you are? Uh, I just want to say Noah, um, in his uh, survey responses, really detailed uh, the ways that he and the artistic director in Nashville um, are moving in community and took a lot of time to put uh, together uh, stories uh, that illustrate the, the points that he was making. So you'll see that live somewhere. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Noah Spiegel. I'm with Nashville Opera. Um, question number five was relationships and resources. What are the relationships and resources necessary for the performing arts to be effectively engaged in placemaking activities? What are the goals and desires of each stakeholder in this work? How and when are stakeholders engaged? So I kind of took inventory of common themes that I heard or read in the survey responses and I broke them down into five top um, convergences. One is experienced leadership, both within organizations and external community organizers who are committed to placemaking as key to organizational missions, as well as community health, who possess robust insight into civic needs and priorities and who are empowered to make decisions regarding resource allocation. Number two is people with specific skill sets that can assist in resource allocation, evaluation, translation, and identifying the right priorities, partners, and making connections across and within sectors. The third is financial support to mitigate risk risk, encourage experimentation, maintain equity between partners and level the playing fields, and help disseminate lessons learned to the wider community. The fourth was energy and assets, including streamlined access to local government resources that are brought to bear on projects to propel success. And the final one is time to build trust, balance disparate mission and vision needs and outcomes between partners, and design true engagement strategies that enable future partnerships to succeed. A few um, important comments that came out in the um, materials provided to me, um, uh, Cookie mentioned at one point that leadership and lead partners have to have the ability to direct actions and make decisions about resources. Um, and Claudia and Sandy both mentioned that we have to shift from something we do when we have the resources to something considered central to the mission beyond the time frame of one single source of support. And Mark Skorka mentioned that 
we have to eliminate the financial risk in order to encourage experimentation and dissemination of results. We have to introduce and sustain cross-sector partnerships um, and maintaining equity among partners financially as well as the expression of mission. Um, Cookie also mentioned one point of divergence in the resource section, which is that um, for her, a lasting cross-disciplinary relationship emerged from the resource-restricted plan versus one which raised significant funding. In goals and desires of stakeholders, points of convergence included relationships that can me yield meaningful outcomes, and they need time to mature and for trust to develop. And a project needs to embody the vision and committed resources of more than one or just a couple of entities in order to deal with recognized power and unrecognized influence. Um, Michael mentioned things including civic application remarks, but also spoke to cross-sector innovation and capacity building. And some points of uh, divergence in goals and desires is that Sandy Bernhard mentioned that, and we've heard this before today, to change the view from outreach to true engagement and building relationships first and design engagement strategies with stakeholders already involved at the point that the engagement begins. And Michael Rode uh, added that breaking community partner needs uh, needs to be in specific areas, including advocacy, dialogue, story sharing, and civic application. Others' uh, responses only included cross-sector innovation and capacity building. And for stakeholders to be engaged, stakeholder goals are likely to be situational, and making assumptions about the stakeholders is very risky. And discovery of mutuality of purpose is vital. Artists all want to share, make work, and earn income. Uh, and points of divergence in stakeholder engagement is that um, only one person, uh, and I don't have that written down, is um, wants that the place-making activity needs to inform audiences' lives and give them pride in their community. All right, thank you. All right, so resources and place. Uh, relationships, relationships and resources. Uh, I was, I really appreciate what you called out. Um, I know that I was first taken when Teresa called out and said, um, some groups might need the folks with community organizing skills, uh, the folks with uh, the, the, the skills that we as performing and producing organizations don't uh, always have uh, as part of the skill set of our staffs. And I really appreciated um, that you called that out uh, and could imagine other kinds of folks playing those roles. Uh, other observations or thoughts about this realm of discussion? Uh, it goes back to a lot of our intense conversation this morning around depth of relationship, partnering, uh, and so on. Um, and uh, it was interesting to read the uh, long version of responses because uh, money did not emerge as the first thing that people put on their list. Uh, certainly issues around uh, investment resources uh, and connection to risk and so on came forward, but uh, other kinds of skills uh, and uh, issues came up as well. Learn to give and Teresa, thanks. I want to, if I heard the comment correctly, which I think was from Cookie about the resource, the the projects that are well funded versus the ones that aren't funded. Who said that? Somebody said something about that that it um, that the sometimes the the systems or the, the the infrastructure to make something happen actually occurs even more quickly. And Oops. yeah, so I'm just thinking or or in a more well thought through way, I'm just thinking about how one of the great things about this discussion is I think all of us We'll leave it, and hopefully those who are listening online or, or tweeting with us, um, it makes you very conscious of your surroundings and sort of paying attention to where there's something going on, that whether it's creative placemaking or whatever we want to call it. And also recognizing that sometimes it's, you know, if there is a little bit of energy happening without any intervention, without anybody saying, here's a big grant or you should try this, that maybe it just does, does take a small amount of whether it's money or talent or um, or easier um, restriction restriction easements or whatever to make something really big happen, so it's kind of identifying where that those that energy is in a way. 
Uh, I'm going to go to uh, Sandra and MK and Jason and Cookie, if you wanted to get into that. Do, uh, do you want to speak first? Um, uh, so in our experience, the first time, the first round, uh, we did raise a significant amount of resources, um, trying to create the project so it could be seen the first time. Um, and it was as the ideas emerged, we would say how much does that cost, and then we would go raise that, that, uh, that level of money. It didn't happen magically, um, but we had a period of time to deal with. The second time we did the project back in Austin, and it had, had gone to a number of cities. So for us, there's this convening and learning, and convening and learning as the project grows. The second time we did it with um, no money. Uh, it was bringing people into the room and saying, these, this, is, these are the conversa this is the conversation we're still having. Um, these are the questions we're still asking. What do you bring to the table? What do we bring to the table? And so it was not, when we, would, we were very honest in saying, um, the starting place is not going to be money. The starting place is the content, the conversation, and the lasting value that we think that we can bring. Um, and then what mm -hmm. happened out of that was um, really actually unbelievable. People saying, I'm an artist and I have visual, I have this wonderful installation, I have no walls. Museum saying, I have walls, but we don't have anything there, why don't you come in? And so that, it, that really was the story, is what happened when everyone brought their, the resources that they had and we began to share those. So that, the story is mostly about what happened with the layering of the community in the absence of someone saying, here's a bunch of money. Not that a bunch of money is not a great thing. I'm not disparaging that. It's just, it can be done the other way. All right. Thank you so much, Sam. And I can tag right on to that. Um, we have a number of projects. Some of them are, are funder-driven and, and are huge projects. But there are some projects that have no money, and they're driven by the artists. They're driven by a theme or an idea. And um, I encourage large organizations, and this is really hard, to have enough trust that the stakeholders sometimes are the decision makers and have better ideas and the larger organizations have to step back and accept those ideas. Um, that's a risk-taking venture for large organizations that is difficult for us to do because we're so in control of everything that we do all the time. And uh, it is probably the most exciting learning that happens uh, when, that, when that kind of art takes place. Uh, this is MK. I just want to go back to the idea of equitable relationships and what that means and clear acknowledgement of what mutual benefit is mm -hmm. and um, and that there is a quid quo, quo pro. I mean, we've had a lot of uh, sort of language around very, very idealistic outcomes and mm -hmm. transforming communities and ending racism and bringing peace to the world and it can easily jump to that level when... Um, each of the entities in a partnership need to be able to frankly right. say, I hope I'm going to get this out of it. And I, and I have structured this so we can get this. And we think by doing it together, this is something that we both want and we can find the way to do it together better than each of us struggling it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. But in a very practical way, that equitable relationship or equitable partnerships is one of the hardest things to create to because create. of the, both the power dynamics and the money dynamics. dynamics. Took the words right out of my mouth, but said it a hundred times better. Um, <laughs> no, I just I just wanted to put the stake in the ground around expectations um, around impact, and uh, I think it, we, it was at GIA when Rick uh, Rick Lowe and Roberta Bedoya were up on the stage. Rick said, "You know, we're in a situation right right now because everybody's so excited about this that everybody's expecting that some of the, one of the most under resourced fields is going to have the biggest impact, and let's just moderate a little bit." And so I think. To, that goes to saying you need to enter these relationships and partnerships with with expectations that are realistic, mm -hmm. and put those realistic mm -hmm. expectations on the table, and put put what it's going to cost to have an artist actually work on a project and pay them a real fee, a real fee to be on the table from the beginning. From the so. beginning, it's great. Uh, Rick also in that conversation said, you know. Uh, the housing specialist in town looks at my 12 houses in my first X years and says, 12 houses. You know, it's not a hundred. Uh, so there, you know, we have to look at whose scale we're we're working on. Um, it's really important. Uh, please, I someone was ready to step up over here. Maria, with you. Um, yeah, I think it's really important to uh, challenge our assumptions and also 
places that we assume other people are operating from, and it's really hard, I think, even this phrase, beyond the building. When I look at that, that's a very privileged assumption that <laughs> we have a building. <laughs> you know, yeah. at Yerba Buena, when we opened, we would, um, you know, try to do things at, at, at different venues, and the folks that have been operating in really almost mm -hmm. non-funded community venues with a good barely afford, you know, 10 pieces of lighting equipment would say, no, we want to come in that house. So there's an, a, a big privilege assumption that we have got to keep in mind okay. when we're addressing these. Um, so I just wanted to get that out there. Excellent. Any more comments, Michael? And uh, then we'll go back to Claudia. Uh, Michael Rode, uh, just something short about partnership. And I, I resonate with what MK said, and I just want to sort of add to it, do a yes and. Um, I think expectations and a conversation about them is part of, actually, a a much more difficult practice than we are sort of uh, mm -hmm. unpacking here. I mean, the practice mm -hmm. of partnership, the practice of listening, the practice of co-design, the practice of creating uh, a sense of expectations and goals together, that's a lot of the work at CPCP that we're doing around the country with artists and community organizations because we actually, just by bringing people into a room and saying, hey, work on expectations, work on goals, sometimes the conversations are fluid, and sometimes there are a lot of issues and dynamics and simply communication strategies and capacities for a variety of reasons that aren't set up to make those conversations happen. So I just think that's a big part of the work. Um, just on the note of uh, partnerships and collaboration, um, in this very important work that we're all involved in, a lot of it's being subsidized by the artists which mm -hmm. is highly problematic. That said, it's difficult to make the case for how much their work is worth um, when we have trouble um, tracking that impact it's having on our communities. But it's vital that we figure it out. I'm gonna take that up. Mitch. So one thing that's really interesting um, that Cookie and Michael have brought up was the conversations they're having in their communities about if you want to participate in this work, here's the how to, and how can these $30,000 grant to just starting off trying to see if your organization can elevate this kind of work within your organization. And I would also add to that, I think a resource that goes underutilized are universities and colleges. And what goes underutilized there is the workforce of, of undergraduate students. It's the studies of graduate students who are looking for things that are meaningful to the work that they're doing, who will work to publish something, who will work to help to define those things. And so I think that's, that's one of those areas where universities have the similar charge of how are we serving the publics that, particularly public universities that surround us, and especially private universities are asking those questions. I would also say I would draw three circles on the board. I just want to do this. Do it. Okay. I'm going to do paper. <laughs> <laughs> and this goes back to... You know, my initial premise of, of how we start our conversations with what do you want, what do I want, <laughs> what do we want together. This in the center is the sweet spot. And there are all of these bigger, bigger, great, wonderful things that we had all the money in the world to do. But once we understand those three things, it's the sweet spot that we focus our resources and our time on. Okay, that's the punctuation on relationship and resources. Uh, so we're going to invite Sixto to uh, get us into the conversation on equity uh, with that summary. Are you going to hang where you are? Yeah. All right, thank you. So I, I got the simple topic yeah. of equity. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which we can solve within the next 18 months. Um, no, so I, I guess going off from Colleen, it's very interesting for me formerly working at Diverse Works as a presenter in contemporary arts field, working mm -hmm. with communities, and, and now transitioning to a university a setting. And what that, uh, what personally that transition to an institution has now uh, given me uh, opportunities for, and how, the, but, and how the separation from the artist and the community is now um, what that reala reala realization actually needs to happen. 
Also, just as a bit of framework, equity is very interesting to me and the University of Houston because we are now, um, we are, quote, the most diverse uh, city in the nation because our demographics are what your city's demographics will be in 2020. Um, and that uh, the recent study um, uh, from the Center for Houston's Future has recognized that the arts organizations, um, that 80% of the resources going to arts organizations are going to the top percent and 20% are going to everybody else. Okay. Um, so equity is very important in terms of how we, how I and the Center for Arts Leadership are looking in relationship to who are we actually empowering, how are we being empowered, and what does that look like? Um, so I guess in terms of the question number six is how can performing arts organizations address issues of social and cultural inequalities and equitable access within their communities using placemaking strategies? I guess first, I think that we still need to do that framework of um, should they be doing it? And uh, because I think that this is a, a value and a philosophical pursuit. And actually, if you do not have the organizational infrastructure and the desire to follow up on this, then actually starting to deal with uh, large and equitable um, in, in terms of the, your programming, I think it's going to be a question. Um, but I think that what we've been talking about all today is how we actually do that and how we actually look at partnerships and that this, in terms of best practice, all of it is talking about how do we create a more equitable situation between artists, arts organizations, the communities that we work in, and uh, both local, national, and international. And um, I think that Mario also brought up the fact that uh, we cannot take this out of, uh, our arts organizations also do reflect the fact that there are inequities within the organization, and how do we face the inequities within our own organization um, and be transparent about that. And so that when we go into creative, uh, the art making and creative programming around placemaking, we need to be looking at it in a holistic way. Um, uh, that by, by part of that, we actually also need to understand what is our own uh, cultural competency. And Sarah brought that up. And MK is that we need to be building on ex existing community assets, not replace them. I think that we've heard from Carlton um, amazingly um, about uh, how a change actually is made from the bottom up. And that um, also, let's reinforce one other idea, is that we need to be looking at um, beyond um, economic indicators as a driving force. And what are the, the other things that we're engaging in? And um, Colleen, after with her diagram, which none of you on the web can see, um, but <laughs> I think is uh, one of the points that she brought up is that how does discussions and designated gatherings raise these issues with an action-oriented agenda? And right, acknowledging that though the conversation might be had, that how are we actually moving from that conversation to, um, to a reality that we all can be effective of. And, and so I guess part of that it is once again, how are we looking and how are we transparent about the values and the philosophies that we are engaging in the creative placemaking process. And so one of the things about when we look about uh, what do performing arts organizations bring to this work and how uh, to the community and what is their assets and relevancy that counts, um, it is about that creative work and uh, Mark sort of brings that the idea of a creative product and it is what we are dealing with and deciding what is produced, how it is produced, where it is produced and the partnerships through which it is produced is of paramount important, importance. And then Sandy brings up the idea of that foster dialogue, interaction, inspiration and connection around the pressing questions for our city. Sandy Bernhardt from HGO is also going back to the excellence, relevance and accessibility. So uh, I think it goes back to this idea about authenticity and that if we are engaging in uh, uh, aspects of uh, equity, um, we need to recognize what are, like how we are being authentic in this aspect because if we, are not, if we are inauthentic, it is pretty obvious to the people and our partners that we're working with, hopefully. Um, and so uh, that the question is, is that if we are also, I guess the question I'm posing is that if we are engaging in creative placemaking work, how is that work actually part of the organization and not separate? And that it is actually part of the values and the ongoing work. Um, and hopefully informing, these projects are also informing how the organizations are talking to their boards, the, their communities, and the artists that, that they work with. Michael Rode brings up the idea that it is already incorporated in the practice, is that art making and place making at the heart of what the project is. We think of the creation and development of that partnership. So in those conversations, in th that actually, uh, who sets the table, where is the table, who is being empowered to bring that to the table. Ashley Sparks uh, also says, uh, 
the table should be diverse and be rigorous in our ethics of whom we make visible and when, and transparent in our actions and our intentions. Um, and then I guess for, it also brings up to me this other issue about translation, because as much as we want to have an inclusive table, we will never have a fully inclusive table. So how do those of us who are sitting at that table, how are we translating that, the experiences of who we are representing? And also, how are we translating that out from those tables to mm. our communities, to, the, the, um, to our constituents? And for me, it is what are the frameworks that, I, like personally, how I'm thinking about how are the frameworks that I'm coming to the table actually affecting what I'm hearing and what I'm listening and what I'm reporting back to. So trying to be transparent about that. So going to very practically, what are the tactics cited for increasing accessibility? And I think that we talk a lot about free, making it available, making it open. And so that Noah talked about uh, multiple initiatives and investigate and, and invest in research, training and outreach engagement for diverse communities within our city and our region. Howard brings up uh, the New World Symphony's Wallcast, which deliver excellent music performance at the highest level and sound for free. Claudia brings free programming in accessible places, uh, presenting work from different cultures and aesthetics. So beyond just free programming, and what are, I guess, part of the other aspects is how are we looking at this not only in the short term, how are we also looking at this in long term in relationship to our programs, and how is that affecting the culture in which we are, uh, the artists that we engage, the communities, the arts organizations that we run or represent. Um, and then also, if we are being effective in this mm -hmm. aspect of addressing uh, inequities, how do we continue to be uh, cognizant of that and continue to make sure that we are not accepting of the fact that we've accomplished this and we get to move on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Very Ooh. nice. Very wow. Nice. Thank you. Thanks to all our presenters uh, this Thank afternoon. Yeah, Appreciate good. that. Uh, the year ending on free. Um, you know, I, I, how many times have you sat and looked as a grant reviewer at uh, the answer to the question of accessibility and see, well, we make it free. Um, and sometimes that resonates, and very often it doesn't resonate at all with me. Um, if I don't really see it connected to a philosophy, a, a larger intention, purpose that's manifest um, in other ways in, the, in an application, um, that it can be the hollowest of answers, and yet it can also be the profoundest of answers um, in some cases where absolutely the barrier has been defined. Um, and a free is exactly what makes sense. That's the political act itself. Uh, so I think um, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated conversation that you got us going on. Mm -hmm. uh, we have just a couple minutes here. Uh, remember, my thought was that we should get into our rooms and into discussion. Uh, anything that you want to get on the table? Uh, thanks, Jesse. Um, Sixto's question about whether or not organizations should get involved in uh, creative placemaking if it's not something that's in their their philosophy and their their value system um, in orchestras it, it's not so neat and you have a lot of internal uh, mm -hmm. tension within the organization so you have you know in some instances significant resources going to uh, El Sistema work you have the musicians in the orchestra in opposition to that because they're seeing their wages cut so you've got um, you know competing priorities going on you have boards who are beginning to wonder, you know, are we in an orchestra or are we in the social service business? And musicians also saying, you know, we came into this because we thought we were going to play in this great concert hall. We're going to play wonderful orchestral music. And now they're telling us to go and do all these, you know, community engagement things. But you also see really interesting changes beginning to happen. And often from the musicians themselves, the, the little anecdote I relayed earlier in Cincinnati, the first year the orchestra did it, none of the musicians wanted to participate. It was a big outdoor concert, all amplified, not exactly an ideal setting for great music making. But after it occurred, the musicians who were there, they all said this was the highlight of the season for mm -hmm. them. And they said that because- As performing artists. As, as performing artists. And because they, they saw what it meant, both for themselves as artists, to see the impact of their work, mm -hmm. but also to see the impact that it had on their community. So th there's a lot of um, currents going on simultaneously. I think it's, it's going in the right direction, but it's kind of understandable that we're in a kind of a push-pull place right now in orchestras. 
really appreciate you putting that on the table. Thank you. Uh, there were a few other hands to equity. Okay. Well, uh, I, can I just say one thing? And and um, it's the notion of free. The notion that community activists and artists all paid to get their craft. And so I have a difficulty with free. I don't have difficulty with accessible. And then the notion is, if we say to someone, this is worth something, they say, oh, it's worth something. Now, how does that manifest <laughs> itself if someone doesn't have whatever monetary amount we attach to it? It may mean that there may be other ways that we find those funds to make those things happen. But we don't ever call any of our events free. We say they're ticketed. They cost something. We're able to support this much of the ticket or all of the ticket. But the notion of worth and value and free, I'm, I'm wrestling myself to the ground with it. So I would appreciate any help at all. All right, I was going to help. I am so happy to answer that question. <laughs> Colleen, I love you to death, break. and I'm totally, totally opposite wow. with that. Because obviously, in my background, I'm a big champion of, of the entire network of thousands of free festivals. And all, I don't have too much time, but all that they offer, including accessibility, families, language barriers, you approach the arts with your life and love and food and all good things. But I, I guess I, I feel that the performing arts uh, gets caught in that dilemma of free. And I'll give you um, uh, just a couple of examples. Um, when the Kennedy Center is inaugurating its new organ, um, there were lines. It, it was a free performance. There were lines around the Kennedy Center in really bad weather of audience members that wanted to come and see that. So when I hear people say, we're losing audience members, we don't have audience members, oftentimes they feel like, no, you do have audience members. They can't afford to get into your house. But secondly, there's... Uh, one of the world's most amazing institutions here that people accept and is totally free and love, and that's the Smithsonian Institute. But no one questions that it is all free. Millions of people go to that each year. But somehow, performing arts, we don't have a Smithsonian, and mm -hmm. we, it's devalued. I wish the Kennedy Center was our Smithsonian for performing arts. So I, I count to you all on right. that. Thank you, Mario. <laughs> Great stuff. Uh, I'm gonna. You gotta, you gotta say, is it burning? Okay, Jason. Jason's got a got a last comment here, and we're gonna break up. And, and Colleen taught me how to argue like that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm being a bad buddy. <laughs> Go ahead, Jason. Um, I just, I'm actually going to be in the equity room, so I could just say it in there. But I just wanted to make sure that in the equity conversation, we do talk about the fractured nat nature of our society right now and the power of performing arts to bridge across those fractures as an incredibly important, important aspect of the work that could begin to address some of the equity issues. I hope so. Um, I think with self-consciousness is what we've been hearing. So I hope that gets played out more.